All right, good to see you guys here this evening. If you want to take your hymnals and turn to number 444, 444, I love to tell the story. And if you're able to stand, we invite you to stand tonight. I love to tell the story of the unseen things above. and his glory of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as none Let's sing it. I love to tell the story. Tis pleasant to repeat what seems each time I tell him. More wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story.
that chorus. Keep your hymnals out and turn over to number 479, and we'll sing verses 1 and 4 of Softly and Tenderly. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 11, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let's sing out on the first and last verse of this song. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. S see on the portals he's waiting and watching, watching. Number four, let's sing it out now. Amen. Amen. Good to see all of you here this evening, and let us go to the Lord in prayer. And Brother Travis Anderson, would you open our service with a word of prayer? Amen. All right, you may be seated. Hey, it's good to see all of you here this evening. We want to also welcome all of you that are tuning in online. 
and we want to welcome those who, you, who might be outside on the radio. And hey, just so you know, um, I haven't shared anything about this in a while, but if you're on Facebook, you can go like our Facebook page and keep up with some things there. But we, we, as of right now, we haven't been live streaming on Facebook because we've moved everything to YouTube. So if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, you can go check it out. And, and the good thing about being on YouTube is um, our services, while they used to be on Facebook, they would get lost in the feed, and it was kind of hard to figure out which one was which. But on YouTube, we're able to um, label everything a lot more clearly, and so you're easily be able to go back and watch some of the services, listen to the messages. It's a lot easier to do that. Um, but hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to live stream to both. We're, gonna, we're looking into that, but anyways, um, if you haven't checked out our YouTube channel, go ahead and do that. Um, and hey, uh, this Sunday afternoon, we'll be taking some of the teenagers to Tennessee and Pigeon Forge to the Arise Youth Conference. And this is very similar to the youth rally that we take the kids to, in, or the teens uh, to in Rafford, Virginia. It's kind of the same group of people. It's just a lot more, there's going to be a lot more um, uh, musicians, a lot of Southern gospel artists that will be there, and a lot more different uh, pastors and preachers. And then we do get to go to Dollywood one day, so I'm excited about that. I've only been to the water park. I've never been to the actual roller coaster park and all that stuff. So it's going to be fun, but pray for us. Uh, we're, we're essentially, other than going to the park on a Tuesday afternoon, we're essentially going to have morning services, and it'll last from about 8, 8.30 to around lunchtime. And then we, from like 5 o'clock to like maybe 10 o'clock or so, we're going to be involved in services as well. So it's a pretty full schedule, um, but pray for us. And if you have any other questions, you can uh, let really let Brother Dave know or Tabitha know, or, or really myself too, um, but we're excited, and um, yeah. Um, and then also, the family camp is, I, I, I want to make sure I get the dates right on this, um, but it's in August, and it's going to be at Springs of Life Church Camp down there in Patrick County, but it's going to be a Thursday the 4th through Saturday the 6th, so it's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We will get down there on the Thursday evening, and we're going to be staying in the hotel rooms, and if you're familiar with the camp, the hotel rooms that are connected to the dining hall, all of those hotel rooms have been remodeled, and they look incredible. They look nicer than a, I know it's shocking for me to say this, but they look nicer than a Holiday Inn Express. It's pretty, pretty amazing, and I, I, they're working on getting the dormitories fixed, and so I don't think if they're all, all those are fixed quite yet, but but anyways, we'll be arriving on the Thursday evening, and we'll be staying through Saturday afternoon and driving back up here. So if you have any questions, talk to Pastor Dave, and he'll get you uh, squared away. But any, any other announcements that, that I might have failed to mention? Um, all right. Well, with all that in mind, just keep, take your hymnals back out. You can remain seated there, and we will sing number 480. 480. Uh, only trust him. start on the chorus. Lonely trust him, only trust him, lonely trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. Come every soul by sin oppressed there's mercy with the Lord and he will surely give you rest by trusting in his word lonely trust him only trust him only trust him now he will save you he will save you he will save you now verse number two for jesus shed his precious blood 
rich blessings to bestow. Plunge now into the crimson flood that washes white as snow. Let me hear on that chorus, only trust him. Lonely trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. Yes, Jesus is the truth, the way that leads you into rest. Believe him without delay, and you are fully. Lift it up on that chorus, only trust him. Lonely trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. Amen. Praise God for some of the truths found in these old hymns. I'm thankful today that no matter where you might be or where somebody might be in their life, God is a God who still saves. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm so thankful for that great truth. Well, hey, we're going to have a special time of prayer. And I'm going to ask if Paul Richard, Brother Paul Richard, if you'd be prepared to lead us in a word of prayer here shortly. Um, but let's let's be in prayer for, of course, um, many of our, our, our shut-ins as far as uh, those that are nursing home bound, uh, such as um, Brother Jack Martin, Brother Ralph Johnson, Brother Chuck Ray, um, Mrs. Shank, let's pray for Brother Joel's mom, and then Miss Rachel Stump. And I know we have many other shut-ins that have not been able to get out as much as they used to, but let's definitely uh, pray for those specific ones this evening. Um, any other prayer needs that you might have on this side of the auditorium this evening? Any special prayer concerns or needs? Yes, Miss Barber. Yes, um, I pray for my neighbor, Amy, that she's going through some difficulty and we pray for her family. Oh, wow. All right. Well, we'll pray for uh, both of those, and hopefully Nathaniel will feel better. Yeah. We're sorry that he's sick. Any other prayer needs on this side of the auditorium? All right, what about this side? Any special prayer needs or concerns? Yeah, Brother Tim? All right, we'll definitely pray for Miss Lynn. I hope her back is feeling better soon. Any other prayer concerns or needs tonight? All right, well, it's a great privilege we have to be able to go to the Lord in prayer. And Brother Paul, would you lead us in a word of prayer for these things?
Amen. All right, take your Bibles tonight and, and let's go to the book of Esther. The book of Esther tonight, chapter number three. Um, if you're watching online, we want to invite you to take a copy of God's Word and to find Esther chapter three. If you're here tonight and you don't have a Bible with you, we have plenty of the Bibles in the pew there that we would encourage you to use. And if you're joining us for the first time in a long time, we are glad that you're here, and we've been walking through the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and now we're into Esther, and we'll be in chapter 3 tonight. And if you're able to, I invite you to stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word this evening. We'll read um, each of these 15 verses, but as I read, you're just welcome to follow along. Esther chapter 3, and... Uh, Remember, as we're walking through this book of the Bible, one interesting fact about these 10 chapters is God's name is not mentioned, but we see the hand of God at work in every single scene of this narrative, and as we will see even in this chapter tonight. But just follow along with me as I read this text aloud. It says, After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him. And set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And the king's servants, excuse me, and all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants which were in the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand. For he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought to scorn to, and he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. In the first month, that is, the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pure, that is, the lot, before Haman from day to day and from month to month, to the twelfth month, that is, the month Adar. And Haman said unto the king Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore, it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries." And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee, the people also, to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. Then were the king's scribes called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors that were over every province and to the rulers of every people of every province according to the writing thereof and to every people after their language. In the name of King Ahasuerus was it written and sealed with the king's ring. And the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women. And one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for prey. The copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people that they should be ready against that day. The post went out, being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan the palace, and the king and Haman sat down to drink. But the city Shushan was perplexed. Let's bow our hearts for prayer. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that your word has power. And we thank you that it has power to transform our lives. And God, we believe that all scripture is profitable, even right here in the book of Esther. 
So God, we ask right now that you would prepare our hearts. God, that you would prepare our ears and prepare our eyes so that we can see, hear, and be transformed by the powerful word of, your, of the living God. And so God, I confess that without your divine intervention, God, me being here and speaking tonight would be pointless. So God, I just pray that you would cleanse me from all manner of sin, that you would set me aside and, and use me to exalt the good name of Jesus Christ and your holy word and the truth of the gospel this evening. And so God, we ask that you would receive all glory, honor, and praise for everything that's said and done, not just in this service, but also in this message. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's people said, Amen. Thank you for standing to honor the reading of God's word. You may be seated. The early 1900s opened with, it seemed, a lot of opportunity to advance society in a technological way. And it did happen. But as the early 1900s began to progress, a war transpired that was called the War to End All Wars. And it left many areas of the world in absolute shambles and ruins. And it ultimately led into the late 20s of the great stock market crash that devastated not just certain aspects of the world, but the entire world. And in the 1930s, that gave way for a major power to arise in the scene. And if you know much about world history, especially in the 1900s, you know that Germany was high on that list. And a man by the name of Adolf Hitler just declared himself to be the ruler of Germany and took over. And nobody, no committee, no team, nobody was to be held at the same level of authority as him. In other words, what he said went. And they began to teach the Germans that the Jews were an inferior race. And they began to indoctrinate young people in the educational system and began to teach that, that other races outside of the pure German line was not the pure race to live on this planet. And that ultimately would lead to the Second World War in 1939 into the early 1940s. And it would lead into, at first, it was not giving those Jewish people the same opportunities as everybody else to work in the workforce. And then it would lead to not doing partnerships with those Jews. And then it would lead ultimately to carrying them off in, on trains to these camps to die. And we are told by the historians that six million Jews and many other millions of people were killed at the hand of the Nazis. I know that in our world today, the Holocaust is looked at as a figment of imagination, but I submit to you, you cannot deny the reality of history in that fashion. This was one of the greatest genocides of the modern era in the entire world history. And I bring that up to let you know that, that behind Hitler, it wasn't just Hitler. There was another person uh, involved in this. Well, not necessarily a person, but another being involved, and it was Satan himself. And if I could, if I could just for a few moments tonight, I want to share with you this thought from chapter 3. God's enemy is always at work. God's enemy is always at work, and he's always going to be enlisting a person. He's always going to try to establish a plan, and he's always going to try to execute certain people. And we see that just as Adolf Hitler set his focus on the people of Israel. Now listen, I'm not here to say that the people of Israel are perfect by any way, shape, or form, but the nation of Israel was a nation that God set aside to bring us the Messiah, and we should be thankful for that lineage. And I am persuaded that God is not finished with his dealings with them, and there's still yet things to be fulfilled in Scripture. But if we could just imagine that Haman is like the ancient Adolf Hitler of the Persian world. Because in Esther chapter 3, we see that he is trying to, to deliver a holocaust to these Jews. 
And instead of several years, and instead of an entire process of, hey, we're going to slowly kick these Jews out of society and send them off to concentration camps, instead of doing it subtly by indoctrinating an entire nation, what he does is he goes to the king, and he tells a very generalized story. And he says, oh, king, there's a group of people that are not obeying your rules and laws, and they are a threat to your throne. And I'll even pay some money to make sure it gets done. And so the king writes this law. And remember, in the Persian world, if a decree was made, it could not be reversed. I don't know why they would establish a government that would do such a thing, but they did in the ancient world. And we find that Haman is now the antagonist of this amazing story about Esther and Mordecai and Ahasuerus and and Haman and God himself. And and even though God is not mentioned in chapter 3, we see that God is allowing this event to take place so that God can redeem his people once again. You know, it's very interesting. Um, they, They call, I think it's the Feast of Purim. I believe I'm pronouncing it right. It, it gets the idea here in, in verse, verse number seven, the word pure here. And, and it gives this idea that, that, that these Israelites, this was not commanded in the Torah for them to celebrate. But it was the post-exilic people, that is those who went off to Babylon, came back to Israel. And they were celebrating this feast of Purim that God delivered the nation of Israel from the threat of Haman's holocaust. And today, I want you to know that God's enemy is always at work. That is Satan. Satan, I believe, is never laying down at night, resting, trying to thwart God's plan. But even in all of Satan's efforts to go against God's plan and to silence the Messiah so that the Messiah would not come, we see that he could not do it. Tonight, I want to kind of answer this question. How is God's enemy always at work? In this passage, we, it's obvious here in this story, in these 10 chapters, that, that Haman is not just an ordinary villain. He's a villain that is being played as a pawn on a chessboard by Satan. And Satan is working in behind these scenes. And the first way that I see the enemy always at work is from the first six verses here. In verses 1 through 6, here's a thought I want to share with you. God's enemy is always at work by enlisting a person. God's enemy is always at work by enlisting a person. Now, very briefly, let me just set the stage in case we all need to review sometimes. But but the book of Esther, even though it comes after Ezra and Nehemiah, the events of the book of Esther take place actually in the middle of the book of Ezra. You see, the first several chapters of the book of Ezra are about the first wave of God's people's rubble coming back to Israel. And then the second wave is with Ezra. And then the third wave is with Nehemiah. And the events of Esther is taking place in Shushan the palace, one of the king's palaces, one of his four major uh, houses that he lived in are palaces in his old Persian realm. And it's all taking place in this one, this area. And it's right in between Zerubbabel and Ezra going back to bring God's people to the land of Israel. And we've seen so far that Ahasuerus was angry and mad because uh, the Queen Vashti would not do what he wanted her to do by coming in and dancing and doing all the things that he desired for her to do in front of all the people that were there. And so he dethroned her from queen and they elected Esther. And that brings us to chapter 3. And in these first six verses, God's enemy is always at work, first of all, by enlisting a person. And we see that his person that he came and found and enlisted in his army and his revolt against God's plan was Haman. Look at verse number one. The Bible says that after these things, now remember at the end of chapter two, the Bible says that Mordecai heard about this conspiracy to try to kill the king and he made all the right people aware and those people died who were trying to kill the king. And then right after this, we don't know exactly um, the amount of time or for what reason Haman was elevated to this position. Perhaps this was the position right below the king in the Persian realm. But the Bible says that he promoted Haman. Now notice the word Agagite. Not a termite, but Agagite. If you're a student of the Bible, you'll remember 
that the king of Agag oversaw the Amalekites in the Old Testament, the book of Samuel. I believe it's chapter 16, if I remember correctly. Saul was king, and God commanded Saul to annihilate all the Amalekites. And King Agag was one, of course. And he chose not to kill the king and did not eliminate everybody and everything. And there are some scholars who believe because it says the word Agagite, that Haman is a descendant of the Amalekites and specifically the king. Whereas Mordecai is from the tribe of Benjamin and he is of the descendants of the Jews. So in a sense, here we have almost a 600 year feud going to place here. Now, we don't know if that is the exact genealogy, but it does make sense. And so we see in this chapter, there's already some animosity and some tension and contention between Haman and Mordecai. But here the Bible says in verse 1 that he was elevated to an esteemed position above all the princes that were with Ahasuerus. In verse 2 it says that all the king's servants were to come into the king's gate and they were to bow in reverence before the king and anybody else the king demanded them to bow down. Now let's pause right here and let me just say this. Now there were times in these ancient cultures that these rulers and emperors and pharaohs and kings were, were treated as if they were God on the throne. And so some speculate that the reason why Mordecai refused to bow down before Haman is because he was being treated as a god, in a sense, like the king might have been treated to. We don't know that to be true exactly, but it might make sense. And so that being said, there they would come in, they would bow down before Haman, just like they would before a king. But obviously, back in Daniel... Back in Babylon, before the Persians took over, Daniel and, and the others, they, they didn't bow down to the king's statue of gold. So it makes sense for these Jews who are living in a pagan culture and a nation not to do something like that if the king and all those who he decreed were gods. And the Bible says that Mordecai did not bow in verse 2. Didn't even give him reverence or respect. And the other servants that apparently were working alongside Mordecai, they began to ask him, why are you not abiding by the king's commandment? I mean, this is the king. And if you disobey the king's commandment in this world, listen, you just didn't go to a little prison for a few nights. They would cut your head off. They would kill you. And so this, whatever it was, must have been very important for Mordecai not to bow down. And the Bible says that, that it comes to pass in verse 4 that when Haman found out that Mordecai did not hearken to the king's commandment and didn't give him respect that he deserved, verses 4 and 5, it says that these other servants went and told Haman, and then Haman noticed that he didn't bow, and he was full of wrath. He was angry. In verse 6, Listen to this verse. In this verse, it's essentially saying that Haman now had a reason to kill Mordecai, but not just Mordecai, but all of his people. And so because of verse 6, because Haman is trying to not just kill Mordecai only, but all those who are Jews in Persia, it, 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 it is perhaps very, very likely that Haman was a descendant of the Malachites. And he was still fighting this tension about how his previous ancestors were defeated by the Israelites. And now he's trying to get revenge. And notice here, it says that, that he wanted to destroy all the Jews. To utterly annihilate them. And so as I read these first six verses, I think about how just as God always raises up people to advance his kingdom here on this earth, Satan will at the same time raise up people to try to stop God's kingdom from advancing. And we see that why would Haman want to kill the Jews? Why We know that, that Haman is not just the one here, but behind Haman, we know that Satan realizes that back in the book of Genesis that God promised that Messiah would come and he would come through the lineage of Abraham and his descendants. 
And so this right here is a very strong effort of Satan of trying to make sure that the Messiah doesn't come so that mankind cannot receive redemption. But I'm here to tell you, the rest of the story will tell otherwise. And Haman, in his greed, in his lust for power, and to try to just kill people at, at, at his great powerful position, we see that it will eventually backfire on him, and he will be the one to die instead. As we move forward in our, in our passage, how is God's enemy always at work? Well, he's always raising up people, enlisting a person. But secondly, as I read verses 7 through 11, I thought about this. God's enemy is always at work by establishing a plan. Not just by enlisting a person, but secondly, by establishing a plan. And here, Haman establishes this idea that would ultimately be the plan to eliminate all the Jews. And I, I found verse 7 really interesting. If you know much about Jewish history, you'll find this is, is, is almost mind-blowing. That when they came together to try to figure out when they were going to do this and when to try to usher in this edict, this same time of the month, Nisan, is around April of our time of the year, March, April, and it's around the time of the Jewish Passover. So I believe that this is coinciding back, that back in the book of Exodus when God led his people Israel out of Egypt and redeemed them from Pharaoh's hand. Here we have another person like Pharaoh who's oppressing God's people Israel, and God is going to deliver them out of this totalitarian rule. It says in the 12th year of King Ahasuerus. So notice from, from the time Esther was voted in or elected queen to here, it's about five years that transpire. And they cast pure. That is a lot. Now remember in the Old Testament and even in the book of Acts one time, in order to make decisions, sometimes in the ancient world they would take they would take something like dice or they would figure out a way to cast some sort of lots. And it wasn't gambling at least when God's people Israel did it. But in this particular case, the reason why this is mentioned is because in the Persian world, they were, they were polytheistic. They believed in many different gods. They would take these dice or whatever it is, was exactly, something like dice, and they would be praying to the gods. And, and they would roll that dice or whatever exactly it was. And whatever it fell on, they were, it was as if the gods were sending a divine message of direction for them. And so... It would be around the month Adar, which is uh, around the month of February and March for us, for when this was going to take place. So, so if you can imagine, if this event that they're rolling this dice is around the month of April, and then it's not going to take place until the next February or March, they have almost a year to prepare. So what that would do, it would almost be like the Adolf Hitler scene where Adolf Hitler came in and he began to indoctrinate how the Jews were not the pure race and they needed to be, they needed to be eliminated from society and, and excommunicated and, and really exterminated. This would give an entire year for the people of Persia to, to develop this tension and then the promise that they would receive their lands, it would be this idea of lust and greed going around and being like, hey, hey, we can get this piece of property over here. We can get this land over here. We can get this, we can get that creating extra tension. And then he goes in, and in verse number 9 and 10, Haman finally speaks. It is his first, or excuse me, verses 8 and 9. Haman speaks for the very first time in this story, in this narrative, in this historical account. And he just basically says there's a group of people who are scattered all throughout Persia who are not obeying your laws, and they have the craziest laws, and Nobody else has laws like them, and it's not profitable for them to be here. And he says, if it please the king, let, there be a, let it be written that they might be destroyed. Notice the language here. Not that they might go to jail, or that not just maybe Mordecai, but destroy them all. The terminology here implies strongly that there's more than Haman writing up this idea, Satan himself. And then he even says, 
I will pay 10,000 talents of silver. Now, we don't know exactly how much this is. Um, one commentator said this would amount to 375 tons. Somebody said that this would be an absolute fortune. And so Haman was one or two things or a combination of both. He was either a very, 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 very wealthy man. Or he was somewhat wealthy and he was going to use all the property that he was going to take from all the Jews after they were dead to use as a way to pay for these people to do his laboring and bidding. And if you could just imagine... King Ahasuerus just went to try to attack the Greeks and try to overthrow them, and he was defeated. And so in his mind, he's probably thinking, man, I really, we could really use some extra money, whether it was 10, 15, 20 million, we don't know, but it was a lot, it was millions of dollars. And so the king, he takes his ring and hands it to Haman. Now that may not mean anything to you. Like you might have your class ring from high school or or you might have all these other rings. Now, if you took your wedding band off, it might mean something, you know, for sure. But, but this signet ring was, was the ring that only the king had. And it was the ring, it was like our signature today. If you went into the bank to try to get a loan, or you want to go to try to buy a car, buy a house, or whatever you're trying to buy, you need to sign, your do, sign it to dotted line. That, that is like this signet ring. That if that signet ring is stamped, it is the king's signature approving this whatever it was. And so he literally gives Haman the ring so that Haman could devise this entire plan, and then he has his stamp of approval. But notice here, notice here, in verse 10, it speaks about, it, it literally gives the epitaph of Haman. Three words. The Jew's enemy in verse 10. Who is also the Jew's enemy? Satan, of course. We know that Satan is behind the scenes here at work. And then verse 11, the king said, the silver is given to you, the people also do with it whatever seems good to you. And so here we see that he established his plan. But I, I want you to know this. Solomon had some great words of wisdom in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 33 about casting lots. And all this was based upon the casting of lot and this divination stuff. And Proverbs 16, 33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. I believe that God is allowing this crazy event, this crazy law to be, to be declared throughout the Persian realm so that God can demonstrate his delivering power. And I'm here to tell you something. The same God that delivered Israel from Egypt, the same God that delivered Israel from the hands of Haman is the same God that can deliver us today from the bondage of sin. And Jesus went to the cross and he came to establish a way so that sinners like us who are lost and on our way to a terrible place the Bible describes as hell could find redemption in Jesus. And today, if that's you, I urge you, to cry out to him for salvation. God's enemy is always at work by establishing a plan and enlisting a person. But thirdly and finally tonight, I want to draw your attention to the last few verses, verses 12 through 15. God's enemy, thirdly tonight, is always at work by executing a people. God's enemy is always at work by executing a people. I mentioned a little bit about this on Sunday morning, but... It's, it's obvious we need the reminder again tonight. In Exodus, we read about Moses coming on the scene and the, the threat of the babies dying there. In the days of Herod and Jesus being born, we saw the threat of Herod's reign. And so he dis, 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 de declared that all the babies, two and under, are to die. And we see that Satan will try to overcome God's plan by killing people. And it is the same story right here in Esther. Haman is out to execute these Jews. Verse 12. They bring in the scribes. That is the experts for writing down laws and edicts and all important documents. They bring them in. 
And they begin to write down all these different things. And, and uh, Haman commanded that, that all the important people, from the leaders serving right underneath him, to the ones serving as governors and overseeing provinces, all of them were to take this and to go out and declare it to the rest. And the letters, the Bible says in verse 13, were, were sent at all the posts. Now I am told by these historians that it would take by horseback and chariot about 90 days to get from the place where they are in Shushan the palace to the very end of the Persian Empire. 90 days. 90 days. Today it feels like it takes 90 days for the mailman to bring your package at the doorstep. Some days it does. Um, I know um, in 2020 I was involved in, in a wedding with um, Miss Marianne. Um, they were both in their 80s and they were both widowed and they fell in love and wanted to get married. And God bless them. It was a really beautiful ceremony. It was just me and them right here in the chapel. It was COVID. Nobody was here. And they live streamed the, the service. But anyways, after the service, you know, you have the marriage license and the pastor has to fill it out. So I filled it out. And the next day or so, I went out to that mailbox right out there and I put it in the mailbox and I put the flag up. And a few weeks went by and I got a phone call from her asking if I ever filled out the marriage thing. And um, the courthouse called me too from Botetot where they were going to live. And so I said, I promise you, hand on the Bible, I filled it out. And I put it in the mailbox. And this has been about 30 days since I mailed it. And so long story short, it rained and the, the envelope got a little wet and it messed up the address. And it took 30 days from right here in Roanoke, Virginia to get all the way to the courthouse in Botetourt County. Long time. Thankfully, that is an exception to the rule. But could you imagine traveling without a mail carrier like our system, but the ancient world, how long it would take to get this edict out? It would take months. Perhaps, perhaps it would take the entire year. But anyways, in this, verse 13, it speaks about how they're going to kill all the Jews. So not, not just the adults, but, and not just the men, but, but all the men, all the women, all the boys, all the girls. Everybody, they were going get to get rid of all of them. And then take all their belongings and their possessions and their property from them too. And so verse 14 says, The copy of this writing, as a commandment, was given to every province and published throughout all the people. And then verse 15 and it speaks about how I went out and, and they made haste to do this. And this last verse is so troublesome. Because we know earlier in the chapters of the book of Esther that the king Ahasuerus was, was known for being a somewhat of a party animal. And so here he is drinking most likely his fermented wine and alcohol. And Haman, who's probably drunk on his power trip and this wine as well. And they're sitting there, but the Bible noticed this. The last verse, here's a glimmer of hope in this doom and gloom chapter. It says, the city Shushan was perplexed. They're like, what is going on? Why are we going to kill all these people? God's enemy is always at work by executing people. He is. I think that, that even though we know it was part of God's plan for Jesus to go to the cross, we obviously see that, that Satan was at work too, making sure he went there and, and he thought he won by sealing up that tomb, but no, he did not. And we see he will lose again here. In the late 1950s, a young prodigy came on the scene in 1958. At the age of 14, he won the United States Championship Chess Tournament. Maybe you've heard of this guy, maybe you haven't. His name is Bobby Fischer. And I know chess is probably not 
the game that you might think would make the world news and international news, but, but throughout the 60s and into the 70s, Bobby Fischer began to develop this amazing reputation as just a teenager living in, I think, New York City, learning to play chess all by himself in his mother's apartment, just playing chess all the time. And they say, the, the biographers say that he was obsessed with chess, and it's all he did. And he mastered the game. Became one of the greatest, if not the greatest chess players to ever set foot on this world. And in the 1970s, he travels and he won the World Chess Tournament. And see, the World Chess Tournament at the time may not uh, sound like it's, it's super um, luxurious, but, but at the time, during these wars that were being fought between the Soviet Union and, and all the world, Bobby Fischer, the first American, not only won the World Chess Tournament, but beat Russia. And he was on all these talk shows, and everybody claims the only person that was more popular than Bobby Fischer in the 1970s was Jesus Christ. <laughs> but if you know anything about Bobby Fischer's story, you know it did not end well. But I bring him up to say this, that as we study the book of Esther, chapter 3, Satan through Haman puts God in check. But the rest of the book will reveal how God will put Satan in checkmate. God's enemy is always at work. So we must always be at work, working for our God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time that we've been able to come here this evening and just sing some of these wonderful hymns like softly and tenderly and, and uh, to study your word just right here. Uh, God, we know that there's a couple thousand years difference here. But God, it's just so amazing how, how relevant your word is today. And Father, your word does tell us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And so God, we pray for that tonight. God, we pray for the Jewish people all over the world that if they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah, God, we pray that you will gloriously save them and that you will open their eyes so that they will see the truth about Isaiah 53, the truth about Psalm 22, the truth about many of these passages about the Messiah so that they could spend eternity with you in heaven. So God, we just ask right now that as we do come to a close tonight and as we part our ways that you will just set a hedge of protection about us god that you will just use us to be your your instruments this the rest of this week and that you will bring us back to worship you this sunday lord willing for it's in christ's name we pray and all of god's people said amen amen and amen good to see all of you here tonight this does conclude our service and you are dismissed